Hello, my people. How's it going? This is the Learn to Code podcast. And this week on the show, I have Buddy Galetti. Buddy is, he's learning at Full Stack Academy. It's a coding boot camp, and it's completely online for 26 weeks. They also have, if you, maybe you've heard of Full Stack, they also have uh, in-person courses in, what's it called? Uh, New York, where I live, and Chicago. Uh, but he's taking the online version. And the, re- the reason I know Buddy is because he's a former student of mine uh, here at One Month. And during that time, he built some really cool things, and then he went off and joined Full Stack. And a few weeks into the program, I get an email from him, and he's showing me just all this cool stuff that he's making using JavaScript and HTML, and you know, also talking about his journey and how he got here. Because Buddy didn't start out his career wanting to become a developer or make apps or anything like that. He's in book publishing. He's a content developer for a company that makes math textbooks for universities. But what he's observed in his field is that it's not enough just to have the print copy anymore in the university. The professors, they are really attracted to to books that also come with, whether it's online supplemental materials or, you know, a version of the book that they can interact with. And so he saw this opportunity to upskill within his niche of book publishing. And that's how he got interested learning to code. And so in this episode, we'll talk about Buddy's journey as a content producer making textbooks to learning to code. What resources did he use? What worked for him? We'll look at coding boot camps specifically because Buddy is studying at Full Stack Academy. And so a lot of this uh, this talk with Buddy will be questions like, you know, how did you get into full stack? You know, how hard is it to get into full stack? How much does it cost? What can you expect? What's the day to day like? Um, you know, how often do you see the teachers? Like really just kind of getting a deep dive into what happens behind the scenes at an online boot camp like Full Stack Academy. So if you or someone you know is considering doing one of these these big immersive 26 week online boot camps, then this is probably an episode that you'll want to listen to or share with someone so that you can really get a sense of what it takes coming into these camps and <laughs> coming into these camps. You need a tent, you need a toothbrush. No, uh, it's a different kind of camp. But yeah, uh, what it comes to going to these boot camps and uh, what to expect from it. And so yeah, I learned a lot and I hope to share that with you. All of the show notes from this will be on our website. I'll put a link in the, in the description, all the transcript and everything. And I hope you enjoy this conversation with me and Buddy Galetti. Buddy, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. Yeah, I'm so excited to chat with you. You started at XYZ Textbooks as a proofreader. Maybe tell us, you know, what XYZ Textbooks is. Yeah, so so we are a publisher, um, first and foremost, and, and we sell mathematics textbooks to uh, higher ed, you know, two and four year colleges. Uh, we mostly specialize in, in developmental math um, textbooks, but we go as high as, as uh, applied calculus. Um, so that's our main market. Um, we, we just did a, a pre-statistics book, um, which is one of the new uh, non-STEM uh, pathways that are being um, introduced into a lot of community colleges and even four years, um, which is a remedial course, but, but um, it offers a different uh, you know, another option for students who don't want to take, uh, you know, a college algebra course who, who, who don't really need it for their major. Yeah. And, and what I think is interesting when, when talking with you is that this, this industry of college textbooks, which is traditionally print. I mean, that's kind of the way I think about it. It's like these big print, like $200 textbooks. Um, they need a lot of, resources right now as far as making digital resources like ebooks or what like code do you do like coding tests like to, like you have to like test that the the math is correct like ha- tell me a little bit about that yeah so a lot of instructors they really they really want some kind of online platform and you know a lot of students too i mean i, I still like the print books personally you know but but there's still an overwhelming demand for for uh you know uh ebooks and and some kind of uh uh, platform that can be integrated into, uh, you know, a learning management system, uh, for instance. So, so it's really helpful for an instructor who, you know, is, is maybe an adjunct or, or, uh, you know, um, is teaching a lot of units and it, it gives them a little bit more freedom to be able to say, Oh, look, I have all this content I can pull from, from, you know, this, this website or, or, or this, this, um, external app that can, that can really help me, uh, you know, 
teach this quarter or, or just develop materials and, and not really worry about that kind of stuff. So teachers can assign online homework, online quizzes, stuff like that. And, and all those problems need to be uh, algorithmically generated. So, so there's got to be someone who goes in and tells, you know, the computer, you know, make, make sure this variable is within these, these parameters or something like that. And, and, and it gets really, you know, it, 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 it's definitely not trivial. And, and when, when you were in college, what did you study? I studied mathematics. Um, and that makes and sense. I, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I studied, uh, I studied pure mathematics, which is, which is, a you know, it's, a in, in the math field, I guess there's pure and, and then there's applied, which is, a there's a lot of angst between the two groups, but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a good time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the rivalry. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm just going to go past that. That sounds really deep. I oh yeah, like man. I'm tripping on some gang warfare with that. Qu- <laughs> that has <those> two <laughs> factions there. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. So anyway, no. Um, okay. So you're doing pure math. You're doing it at college. You get hired as a proofreader. At the time, did you know how to code when, when you got hired by XYZ? Uh, no, no. The, the, the only thing I could say that was like kind of coding that I knew how to do was uh, LaTeX, which is is a typesetting software or not software, but it's just a typesetting language that uh, works really well with with uh, typesetting math. And I use that in grad school mostly just to 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 make all the, you know, ba- basically write my homework and then also, uh, you know, develop any uh, teaching materials that I needed for the for the classes that I was teaching. Uh, during that time, uh, so so I knew I didn't I didn't know any code I didn't know HTML or or CSS or, or anything like that. So where did you start to learn to code? Yeah, so I, I was going through um, at work. We have just a, da- a giant database of like a hundred thousand math problems, and most of them are duplicates. You know, because anytime you you duplicate an ebook, it kind of duplicates our our examples in, in this database, which is which is another problem that we've been trying to deal with. Um, but I had to go through and just do. I, we we wanted to convert all of them uh, to to LaTeX so we could be a little bit more ADA compliant. Um, so you know, because c- all of the examples that appeared in our ebook at the time were, were just PNG files or, or images, um, which really didn't lend well to being. You know, used on a mobile uh, platform or, or you know, a tablet or something like that. You know, it, it just uh, it wasn't. Uh, what do you call it when <laughs> when you resize the screen? It's, it's responsive. Uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so that really helped uh, uh, make everything a little bit more responsive. And uh, once I started doing that, um, I started coding some problems in our in our homework system uh, that required some HTML and some knowledge of. Uh, of kind of like a PHP uh, type language, which I still I, I can't say that I've no PHP, but but uh, <laughs> I've heard the stuff I do is like PHP. Um, so, how did you start learning those programming languages? Uh, just basically trial and error. <laughs> I just kind of go in, and uh, you know, if I had some some uh free time at work um to you know in between projects or something i i would just spend all my time on the computer uh trying to figure out you know what's the best way to to display this and then i started learning about html and uh kind of just started going down the rabbit hole and then now now you know the more i learn the more i'm trying to apply it to something at work cool um so then you listen to this Dungeons and Dragons podcast and you hear about one month and yeah. then you end up at one month. What were you able to build at one month? Yeah. So, so first I, I did the HTML, uh, one month course. And, um, it's funny when I go back and look at that code, it's, it, you know, it's amazing how much, you know, how much I know now and, and, and I can look at it and, 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 uh, see some stuff. But, um, I, we built, uh, I think I built kind of like a blog uh, for you guys, um, which I actually used later on, kind of that that template uh, to launch um, one of my websites um, or my my only website. But um, 
so we built that. I think we did some like, you know, it's, it's, it's actually really fun because I think what you guys do at one month is you really introduce it and you get this like first impression of something that's totally scary, like HTML or CSS or just coding in general. And you guys, you guys kind of give it that really good first impression. Cause you know, you, Chris, you're just sitting there like, you know, drinking your iced coffee and like being like, okay, we're going to do some coding now. And then you show us some like funny meme that, <laughs> you know, that's going around and, and it just it just kind of takes all the the kind of you know preliminary fear that you have going into something like that and uh kind of makes it a little bit more casual yeah because it, it sounds like it was was it scary learning to code at first oh totally because because all you do is like all you can do is really like google stuff and then you just see this alphabet soup of you know everything and, and uh it's so hard to to just digest um so, so going into one month, like just after that, that first, uh, HTML class that I took, um, you know, I, I, I started, you know, anytime I wanted to like, you know, Google something and figure out how to do it, you know, I could notice a, a few things that I recognized and be like, okay, this, this does that. And then I get it. And then I got started or then I got more comfortable, I guess, uh, reading, you know, some documentation and, and, uh, uh, just, you know, more about like, I guess, libraries. I, I, I even started taking your, your JavaScript class, but then I, I technically didn't finish, even though like, <laughs> even though I watched all the videos, I, I didn't get the last project turned in on time because I was just busy at work. But, um, yeah, um, the Google, the Google I still charts. like, yeah. Yeah. And that was like, that was, that was the hard one. I still have trouble with, with JavaScript for sure. But I mean, that's like, that's the hard one. Right. So, um, but, I can't even tell you like how, how valuable that, that class was even, you know, j just now going through full stack, like these first three weeks so far have just been like hardcore JavaScript. And, uh, yeah. So let's talk about that. I mean, I'm always curious, uh, because I know the founders of full stack and I've heard so many great things and it's awesome that you have experience with one month and with full stack. So how did one month prepare you? to join full stack academy oh like yeah it, it's amazing like you know you just get so lost when you, you start hearing all these words and the, and the jargon and people start you know people who are teaching it start replacing words with other words that they know because you know that that's the way it's 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 said in you know in industry or something like that when you're first learning something and you hear something like calling a function or invoking a function or passing passing a, a callback function or something like that. It's just like, um, you know, you gotta be really careful with the words you choose when you're trying to teach that. So, you know, cause, cause I, I think, you know, it's, it's something that obviously uh, you can lose a student, you know, very early on. Um, so just knowing all that nomenclature and knowing kind of, you know, you kind of have that muscle memory of, you know, writing the function keyword and then, you know, the double, you know, naming the function and the double parentheses and then double brackets and all that stuff and making sure you have all the syntax down and you kind of know um, about, you know, what all the words mean. I, I think, I think that's such a huge benefit. Cool. Um, yeah. The, the thing that I get really excited about when I'm teaching people how to code is that if you learn one language, the fundamentals of one language, then it's not too difficult to learn another language. Like for example, in the JavaScript course, the first week is, I believe it's called uh, 10 concepts that are the same in every programming language. And you know what you can do with that, like if you know the basics of variables, loops, functions, commenting, these kind of things, then you can oftentimes, you know, go to Python or I don't know, go to Ruby or whatever language. And you kind of have that fundamental, you know, all this jar, all this kind of jargon that you're talking about invoking the function, yada, yada, yada. Like a lot of that's the same. And I think it's really reassuring because also when people start, they ask me, well, which language should I choose? And people sometimes won't choose start coding because they'll kind of like, start a little bit with one, start a little bit with another language. But if you go, if you kind of go, I mean, that's why we call it one month. If you go like enough, if you've done, you know, a few projects, you start to see the patterns. And then all of a sudden, I think it just opens up this whole world. Oh yeah. I, I would totally agree with that. Um, especially since, um, 
you know, like at first JavaScript like did not sit well with me. I just had like a lot of trouble with it. Um, but then I was like, okay, uh, well, let's try Python or, or let's try jQuery. Um, and, and, and just having that, that those basics down, even, even though like, um, you know, it, you definitely learn something going through it. You know, you might not have, you know, retained everything, but you still gain some kind of knowledge and, and you start to see those patterns. And then you might, so one benefit of that is you might see a language that you like better because, you know, it just makes more sense to you. Um, and, and then the way they use their keywords and, and all that kind of stuff. So that, that was definitely my experience going into to Python, which, which was fun. And then jQuery made so much more sense to me than, than JavaScript. Yeah, when did did learning jQuery first help you learn JavaScript or was it vice versa? I did it I did it the opposite way, but but I really I really so we had a programmer at our work who was using using jQuery uh, on a site um, but then that project kind of got kind of got uh, abandoned cuz he, he was I think he was just a student at Cal Poly that was uh, working part-time. Um, but you know, he was learning jQuery and he was like tell me about it and I was like, "Oh, that sounds cool!" And I know there's a one month course for it, so I just I just took it, and uh, and uh, I think you know one of the main things I had such a problem with with JavaScript was trying to learn. Uh, oh God, what is it? It's like the not the event listeners, but you know the, all the queries that you needed to do, um, just to just to get the things that you wanted. Um, I was just having trouble getting the hang of it, but jQuery kind of condensed it and said, "Hey, you know." Uh, here's how you can really just grab this or grab that. Cause I think that's what jQuery wants to do. I don't have a lot of experience with it, but you know, I definitely learned a little bit. Yeah. For a long time, I've argued that students should learn jQuery first and then learn JavaScript. And I've, I've gone back and forth over the years. I mean, I think the argument for doing jQuery before a JavaScript is that when you do jQuery, you can really visually get satisfaction of, oh, jQuery is used when I want to move an image across the screen, when I want to have some kind of animation, when I want to click a button and have some kind of events or actions occur. Like it's it's really like a visual, you know, and, yeah. and what maybe people when they're starting to realize is that it's actually just JavaScript. jQuery is JavaScript, but it's just kind of, uh, how do you say, it's like abstracted or it's just made easier, you know? So, yeah. so the, the problem, I was getting a lot of arguments uh, for people who are, advanced they're saying hey don't learn jquery first because well first off like it kind of hides some of the hard parts of javascript and then also it's not jquery isn't as popular these days as it maybe used to be like i don't know 10 years ago or something so so like i think depending on who you ask you're going to get different answers but i would say that i know i love your story because it really like hits home to what i've seen in a lot of students is that yeah if you are having trouble with javascript and you're starting with it doing some jQuery and like getting to visually see kind of the big picture. I think it helps maybe contextualize like, Oh, this is like where yeah. all of these, <laughs> you know, all this nitty gritty is going. Yeah. And I think that's one of the like great things that's so inherent to, to learning how to code is like, you can literally like poke it with a stick and, and see what happens. You know, <laughs> you can kind of change, change, uh, you know, one string in one location to another and, and you know and, and run it and you know you might get a ton of errors but you know that that's a learning moment where you, you can google it and kind of try to uh, figure out what's going on so I kind of like that aspect of coding is you know I, I was in pure math so math pure math is kind of like uh, math looking in on itself you know but when it comes to when it comes to coding like I, I strictly see it as this really cool tool or you know all these different tools that I can I can do like really cool math with or, or display really cool things or, or 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 run like you know really long programs that that do pretty awesome things. That's awesome. I love that. And uh, and speaking of JavaScript, I mean full stack is you were saying pretty it's pretty heavy JavaScript. Is it is it one hundred percent JavaScript? Or let me rephrase the question: what what are you learning at Full Stack Academy? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so the first four weeks, they, they say is kind of like the fundamentals um, uh, of coding, but we've, we've been doing strictly JavaScript um, right now. And then we're going to touch on a little bit of HTML, uh, CSS, and then we're going to go into um, learning React.js, which is um, I know nothing about, to be honest. Um, I, 
I've heard like scary things <laughs> about it, to be honest, uh, you know, just being hard to learn. Um, but I'm hoping, you know, uh, with all the work that we're doing so, uh, you know, so far, um, it, it'll be okay. But, um, so right now we've been learning, uh, just basically, you know, we started really easy, you know, all, all the different data value types, you know, you know, what's a string, what's a number, what's, you know, all these different things. Um, and then we started talking about loops and control flow, uh, which is, which is really cool. I, you know, I guess I didn't realize, you know, control flow, if you can visualize it, which is basically the way your program, um, runs in kind of, in kind of like a linear fashion from top to bottom, but you can, you know, there's a reason they call it loops. It's because the control flow will just loop back around or, you know, if you're inside a for, for loop or something, you know, and, you know, you got to make sure you get out or, or whatever. And, and then even little things like understanding what return does versus like a console log. Um, Cause I think that's what you see like really early on. And it's so great, you know, like console log is so powerful and, and really good uh, teaching tool. Um, and then, but trying to distinguish that between what a return does, um, I didn't even really get that until like, <laughs> until like last week, you know, where, where return would actually just replace kind of like the expression where, where you call the function. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yo, you sound, you sound like you know what you're talking about now, man. You got, you got this down. <laughs> it's, <great. laughs> it's cool. That's to good. See. Yeah, it's cool to see because I mean, you, it's cool to see like you started with us, and then I mean, now you're like deep into it. Now you're teaching it. <laughs> oh yeah, I, you know, I'm so I'm so jealous of, of coding because it's such a it's such a good like uh, model of like an education. Um, there's so many things that I, I like about it that I wish uh, math mathematics education could could emulate. Um, you know, especially when it comes to what we do in full stack, which is called pair programming. Um, and that's where, you know, after every lecture, you know, we're, we're in class um, for three hours, but, you know, only an hour of it is lecture. And then what we do is we break out into pairs where, you know, we share our computer screens and we work through problems. And the problems are meant to be, you know, hard. They're, they're, they're meant for us to, to struggle. But, you know, it, it's that productive struggle that I think um, is just so powerful when it comes to learning. Um I, I think it's it's such a good model uh, to to follow. Um, I wish math could <laughs> could do it. Um, yeah, I'm I sure love, there's ways. I, I love I love that because that was the thing about coding is it gives you critical thinking skills because you have to. I mean, you're just solving problems is really what it is. But oftentimes there's not a map for how to get from point A to, you know, you, you know where you are and then you know where you want to get and you kind of have to make the path. And I think part of that is just all these different kind of skills, which are honestly like really hard to teach. It's hard to teach the skills, but it's, it makes sense to use coding and you just happen to learn the skills along the way. Like these kind of critical problem solving skills that apply to so like to apply to math, but honestly apply to like, I don't know, p packing your luggage when you get there, <laughs> like girlfriends. Yeah. Like, I don't, I just feel like it's like, it's just like a way of like debugging the world and like, yeah. for, I, I find this very useful. So I, yeah, I like that you're saying that. Yeah. Um, and you know, one thing they do is they use kind of like this cohort model, um, where, you know, we have this group and, and you're, you're all in lecture together and you're meeting all these people and, and they really try to facilitate kind of that family atmosphere where you're all in it together. And it's kind of funny cause I, I actually, I was listening to your podcast, the on books one, and I picked up that book, um, ego is the enemy. And I started trying to do something that I learned from that book, whereas that, I think it was the philosophy from uh, uh, Frank Schramach or something, where it was like the plus minus equals. Do you remember that? No, remind me, tell me about it. So it's basically like, is you know, if you really want to master some some kind of uh, thing that you're trying to learn, you want to surround yourself with with people that know more than you, so that's your plus, and then minus is is the people who maybe don't know as much as you, but, but you, you can you can try and teach them so that that really helps you learn and then also just surrounding yourself with a bunch of you know people who are in the same level as you so um it, yes, i think i love that yeah i remember that now and i think they give this example yeah. of the guitar player from metallica i think it was kurt kurt hammock and uh yeah and it was the best story because it was i'm gonna try to my best to remember but it was more or less he was at the top of his 
game. Like he was basically in Metallica, yada, 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 <laughs> like, you know, like on TV, whatever. And yet he was with the people in Metallica. It gave him the kind of uh, like, like running a race. Like you were kind of like side by side. And then he was teaching people on the side how to code. And then he was still <laughs> learning and taking lessons. And it's amazing to think, you know, how many times I've been in my life and uh, honestly, like, you know, there's some moments in your life when you're like, oh, I did that. You know, like, <laughs> you're like, yeah. yeah, like, like I'm pretty good. Like at one point I was like really, really, really good at WordPress, you know? And, and, uh, and you know, so, sometimes I'm just being like totally honest. It's easy to go like, I know this, there's nothing else to learn. Right. And it's so, yeah. it's so false. There's always so much more to learn and reading ego is the enemy. And this, this idea of what, what he called the plus minus, I forgot, I forgot that was the name. Um, yeah. You're just like, Oh my God. They're like, this is how these people are so great. Like they just keep learning. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, I think especially when, when you're in that kind of atmosphere where you, you feel like you're at school and like, it, I think it, it kind of, if you start thinking about it that way, it, it really kind of takes a, a lot of the anxiety out of, you know, raising your hand and asking a question. If you just think about it, like, oh, that, that guy's one of the pluses I'm trying to learn from. It, it kind of, it kind of alleviates some of that stress. Cause like, I remember like, so, so we do full stack, you know, just online in a zoom room and, uh, I, I pressed the button to like raise my hand and then all of a sudden I like started shaking. I was so nervous, you know, when they're going to call on me, but you know, um, and, and just going back to like my teaching days in grad school where, you know, being on the other side of, of, you know, uh, the student's perspective, um, as a teacher, you, you really want those students to ask you the questions and, you, and you're not really thinking, well, I, I guess I'm talking subjectively, but you really, you really want to, to try to answer their, their questions in, in a meaningful way. So, but, but when you're a student, you're so nervous of raising your hand and asking a question, or at least in my case, you know, that was, that was one of my hangups for sure. Um, but thinking about learning and the process of it with that plus minus equals philosophy, I think, I think has really helped me um, at least when it comes to, when I start thinking about contributing to my cohort um, I love in it. general. That's re that's really powerful and such a really inspirational thing when you're trying to learn to code because there's always I mean there's so many things I don't know you know what I mean there's yeah. always so many things you know and I've been doing this for 15 years and there's so many things I don't know yeah <laughs> I want to I want to hear more about um, full stack because you're mentioning some things and I think if for people who are listening maybe one month students who are listening or really anyone they might be wondering, you know, should I do full stack Academy? So can you tell us a little bit about the day to day, you know, maybe some of, cause you're doing it all online. It's 26 weeks and mm -hmm. you, you shared that you're learning some HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and react pretty soon. Well, what, you know, what else is that day to day? Like, um, just go a little more into it. I'd love to hear. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's really good. They, they have their own learning management system um, uh, called LearnDot. So, so you just log into their website and they have all these uh, different exercises for you to do. Um, they, they, it's almost like a flipped classroom in a sense where you, you have a lot of pre-work before, before a lecture. So, so a lot of reading, um, a lot of, um, you know, trying some example codes. And, and they integrate this, this app into their learning system that's called REPL, which is which is something I just learned about. But it's basically just a coding like environment or a place for you to like write your code and and run it inside the browser instead of like using a text editor or something like that. And it has built in tests that full stack has coded. So so you know when you hit run and, and hit submit or something like it that it's 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 doing all the things that you want it to. Right. And then if it's not doing the things that you want it to, it'll, it'll tell you specifically um, what you need to, to change or, or uh, well, not necessarily change, but what you need to get it to get your function to do or, or whatever it is you're working on. Um, so that's kind of like the day to day. So bef that's that's usually our pre work. And then during lecture, we'll have an hour lecture. And the the professor, I guess you'd call him is uh, his name is Eric Katz. Um, um, and he lives in New York also. Uh, and uh, so he's on there and he, he does his whole thing for about an hour. And there's also teaching fellows in there, which are kind of like TAs. And, uh, and so you're and, all and, in a Zoom room and it's all live. It's not pre-recorded. Yeah, exactly. So, so you know, sometimes you got to make sure your microphone's off, you know, in, in case uh, 
uh, I don't know it, it, when it shouldn't be, I guess. But um, yeah, so you, you can fully like, you know, turn your microphone on and, and, and uh, you know, interrupt them and ask a question. So it, it really has that in class feel. Um, and then once lecture is done, we break out into separate Zoom rooms where it's just you and another student from your cohort. And and then you have a bunch of workshop problems that you need you need to, to work through. And you, you're, we're usually given like an hour at least to, to work on those. And they really um, they really encourage you to, to do that kind of like pair programming thing. So, so the, usually the way I like to do it is, you know, say, hey, like, uh, you know, do you want to share your screen or do you want me to share my screen first? And, and we can work on this. And you kind of take a driver's seat or the passenger seat. And, and then you just switch off once you get to the next problem, which is really cool. Um, and what are you coding in like what what text editor are you using or is it all yes. online? yeah it's all online it's it's still in their learning management system and it's a uh, it's that repl environment I, I think the website is called repl like r-e-p-l dot i-t yeah i can put a link to it in the show notes for anyone listening it's really cool the, the only thing that gets a little confusing is that if you hit run no matter what the last line of code is it'll it'll actually log whatever the last line is, so even if you don't put console.log um, to run it. So sometimes you can get hung up on that. But I think like, you know, if, if you're working it in and you start to get familiar with JavaScript, um, you, you, you won't worry about it too much. That's, that's really great. So when you're doing the pair programming, which if anyone listening doesn't know, that's basically two people working together on one coding problem, so to speak, in your case. So the person you're collaborating with, where are they from? Is everybody from different parts of the world? Yeah, yeah um, it's definitely so. Our classes are Tuesday and Thursday nights, um, Pacific time at six thirty, uh, six thirty to nine thirty. So, so most most of the people in my cohort are actually from the San Luis Obispo area because uh, it's actually the the new partnership with with the Cal Poly Extended Education Program, I think. Um, so, there's a lot of people who live locally here in SLO or, or just in the SLO County. And uh, there's definitely some people from the Bay Area, like up in, up near San Francisco, and I think there's some people from Washington, and uh, and, and I think that's about it. So it's, it's a lot of people from the West Coast, but I think mainly that's just because of the the time slot, uh, you know, for this cohort. But I but I know they have different. I mean, they have more than one cohort, obviously, that that runs at different times. That's amazing. And does Full Stack Academy promise that they can help find you jobs afterwards? Yeah, I mean, well, they, they don't like promise you'll get a job or anything, but um, they definitely, you know, part of it is a lot of like kind of preparing you for for trying to find a job, you know. So, so I, I think part of the course is, you know, near the end we'll have to, you know, produce a resume or you know build our portfolio with all these projects. So we're, we have some projects that we're going to be doing apparently. Um, so we'll have that by the end of it, and then you know, it's it's kind of you got that network now where you've met all these new people and. And, um, you know, you can kind of use that to your advantage. It's probably different for, for every student. Um, I've seen a lot of, a lot of, a lot of their students doing, getting really good jobs. Um, but they definitely help you prepare for that. And, and, uh, I, I haven't experienced that much, but, you know, I, I actually just booked in office hours for tonight and I might ask some like, cause I'm really interested in the professional development type stuff. So that's great. So you can book office hours with one of the TAs and is, are the TAs available also during the paired programming? If, if the, if the pair has a question. Yeah, they are. So, so there's like a chat feature and I think you can, you can chat them or, or shoot them a message on Slack. Cause, cause we have a whole Slack thing too. Um, and you know, it, sometimes there's been issues with, you know, the tests not, you know, coming out the right way or, or something like that, or whenever we run our code, like maybe there's a bug in the system or something, but, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're there for you. Um, you just got to shoot them a message and, and they'll help you out. And roughly how much does full stack Academy cost? Uh, it's about, okay. So I got the Cal Poly discount cause I'm an alumni, <laughs> but, um, uh, for me, it's, it's cost me almost $11,000. Wow. It's, okay. It's, it's quite a, quite a bit of money, but you know, I, it, it took me and my wife like a really long time to, to decide to do this. Um, and it was a, definitely a really hard decision, um, whether or not to do it. I'm, I'm definitely really happy I did it. Um, it, it is a lot of money I know, but 
I, I was looking at into a lot of other other coding boot camps similar to it, um, and noticed that you know they, they won't charge you anything, but but they'll, they'll also you you have to pay them seventeen percent of your your salary or something for for two years after you get a job or something like that. You're talking about other coding boot camps. Do you remember any of the names? I don't, but I, I was looking on CourseReport.com, mm. um, which is a really good resource um, for for coding boot camps and and trying to find out which one uh, will will be good for you or whether it's not good for you. That's awesome. Um, so it sounds like Full Stack Academy has been worth it so far. Yeah, so far it's been great. Like I, I've learned a ton just in you know two and a half weeks uh, of doing it. It's it's been really great. Oh my god, that's great! And you know, be, before we finish off. Uh, before we finish chatting. So I'm just curious because you started and you were a proofreader at XYZ textbooks, and now you're really just going down this, this path of teaching yourself how to code to full stack Academy um, one month as well. What is the impact that learning to code has on your job now? Oh, I, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be big because I, I think the way things are headed, um, there's just going to be such a demand for someone with with these kinds of uh, uh, skills or you know this kind of skill set, and my idea is you know I really want to be influential in, in mathematics education, and if if I can if I can take this skill set and my my in you know my uh, knowledge of you know math and and, and education, um, I'd really like to combine them and, and you know eventually work for you know a company that that's that's big in ed tech or you know, uh, is, is doing some kind of stuff that's going to revolutionize, you know, education in general. Yeah, that's amazing, buddy. You have so many things going on and you also have a bunch of side projects as well. So I'm going to leave in the show notes, some information about you. So if anybody has any follow-up questions, maybe if you don't sure. mind. Oh and, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, great. And then they can, they can learn about you and, uh, and it sounds like you're up to some amazing things. Thank you so much for being on the learn to code podcast today. Oh man, it's been great talking to you. Like I feel like I've kind of known you for a while, but just talking to you on Slack, but it's it's really cool to to finally meet you. All right. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with me and Buddy. If you would like more information or have any questions, you can find the full transcript and all of the links and everything we talked about at the One Month blog. So just go to onemonth.com and click on the blog. You'll find it there. Uh, you could also email me directly at teachers at onemonth.com. Let me know if you have any questions about what boot camp do I take? How do I start learning to code? All of this. Uh, and this is still a new podcast. So if you have any friends that you think this would be helpful for, or for you know, anyone that you could just share the word and spread the word to, um, that would be awesome. Just tell them that the podcast exists and send them a link. Um, put it in an email, give them a phone call, tell your mom, tell your mom's kids. That's you. So that doesn't make any sense, but you know what I mean? Just like spread the word, uh, on Twitter or whatever. It would just be super helpful. And yeah, if you put at Castig, uh, C-A-S-T-I-G, that's me, um, you know, in a tweet or Facebook or something. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to retweet or give a thumbs up or, or anything I can do, um, to let you know that I am super appreciative. So thanks again for listening. The last thing I would just say is, yeah, if you want to learn to code with me, I have online coding courses for the best first month of HTML, JavaScript, Python, and WordPress, and a few more. And that is also all at onemonth.com, where you can come and take courses with me and get support and grading and all of the wonderful things that we offer at one month. So please check that out. And also let me know if you have any questions about that. <laughs>